Thank you, Dr. Navin. At the outset, I thank Amity University for giving me an opportunity to share some experience. So before I get into the presentation, I pray Almighty to give strength and immunity to all of us amid this COVID pandemic. I wish all of you a safe day and stay healthy. The topic of today's presentation is case studies, site investigation for offshore and online development and integrated approach. We normally advocate this integrated approach, meaning perform a geophysical investigation, identify the geohazards, and then develop the scope of geotechnical investigations and combine all the data together and use that for the assessment and design of foundations. So I'll go through some of those <coughs> artifacts in the investigations, both geophysical, geohazards, and geotechnical, or the offshore developments, both in shallow waters. And I'll give you some introduction to how it is done in the deep water. And lastly, some few case studies on both offshore as well as some onshore projects. You know, these marine or offshore site investigation can be categorized based on the water depth. That is up to 15 meters, we term it as near shore, where the procedures, technologies, people, process, all of them follow the onshore practice. When the water depth exceeds beyond these depths, then these methodologies, what we normally adopt in the onshore and near shore uh, locations, is not applicable because you need different kinds of uh, equipment, you need different kinds of tools, uh, experience. So thus, we determine, define the shallow waters up to about 150 meters beyond 15 meters. And the deep water is between 15 to 1500 meters. Ultra deep water is between 1500 to 3000 meters. So we do have deep water locations in India, in the East Coast itself. Now, currently, there are some projects happening around 1600 meters water depth, where ONGC is also contemplating to have the development in the ultra deep waters around 2500 meters, maybe in the next few years' time. Richard Handy has beautifully said that virtually every structure are supported by soil or rock. Those that aren't either fly, float, or followers. In this course of presentations, let me introduce some floating structures also that is normally adopted for oil and gas exploration in deep waters. So usually the phases of oil and gas exploration will be two poles. One is the exploration stage, the other one is the production stage. In the exploration stage, normally they will use these chaka bricks, which is a ship by itself, okay, and has three legs. At the locations, these legs will be lower down into the water and touch the seabed. Slowly, the entire ship, we call this as hull, the entire ship will be lifted out of water from hydrostatic conditions, buoyancy, the, all the dead loads will be now transferred through these legs. The legs will start penetrating into the seabed and it will stop where your ultimate bearing capacity exceeds your applied load. Then once the leg penetration has stopped, then this entire uh, hull is raised to an operational height. We call it as an air gap, normally about 8 to 10 meters. Then the cantilever will come out and with the drilling rig, then they will drill for the oil explorations. So once the wells have been drilled, you find out there's a good reservoir, the quality is very good, then the production stage will happen. During the production stage, the fixed platforms will be installed for pumping out the oil or gas. These platforms <coughs> will be uh, constructed by fabricating a jacket structure. So I can see here, the length of this jacket structure will be equal to the water depth. It can be a four-legged, as you see here, maybe a tripod, maybe eight-legged, depends on the designs. And these jackets will be appended on the seabed, okay? And then the piles will be driven through this jacket can and below the seabed. As you can see here, the piles are going below the seabed until the design penetrations are reached. Once the piling is completed, <coughs> the entire jacket is welded to the piles, so where even the load of the jacket is transferred to the piles. There is a top deck which will be fabricated in the yard. They will bring it and then place it on the top of the jacket and weld it. So now you are ready for the production. The production normally happens through these conductor slots. You can see here, okay? And then the drilling will happen and reach the reservoir. Once the drilling is completed, then they start pumping this into the processing unit and further through the pipelines to the shore. When the, the jacket structure are appended on the seabed before piling start, this has to withstand the sulfate of the structure. So this is by means of what we know call as mud mats. 
these are the temporary seafloor supports and this uh, can be designed is a simple shallow bearing capacity problem various shapes and sizes are uh, commonly used now what you see is a rectangle it can be a square triangle uh, or a circular uh, shallow foundation so once the, uh, the jacket is lifted and placed on the seabed then there will be a piling through the jacket cans driven those in some hammers okay and then the jacket will be welded to the pile the top deck will be lifted will be placed on this uh, piles and finally it is ready for the production stage now the jacket structure is installed constructed now the jacket brick will come for the second time so first it has come to the locations during the exploration stage now is a time for the production the platform is installed and the jacket brick will come for the second time so in the, this uh, time the jacket brick will come close to the platforms the cantilever will be on top of the jacket and it will be drill, drilling the wells through the conductor slots when the drilling is completed this will go away and then there will be a production quantity the life of those reservoirs maybe 15 years 20 years depends so what is the geotechnical challenge here the foundation assessment of the jacket brick in the open locations in the exploration stage you need to make the assessment the leg penetration the risks and hazards during those installation and for of these jacket bricks mud bags is a shallow bearing capacity this is a geotechnical problem and design of the pile foundations again is a geotechnical problem so the three phases the pre-installation phase for the hammer selection the uh, construction phase during driving monitoring and the post-construction phase for the capacity evaluations and uh, the geotechnical engineering will also be for the design of pipelines as the explorations goes deeper and deeper waters you see the piling are also longer and longer okay beyond about 100 150 meters those fixed structures we call it as compliant towers okay. some of them have been built 400 meters maybe the recent one is 609 meters these are taller than any of the monumental structures in the land that we all of us are aware of now as the explorations goes deeper into deeper waters the fixed structures becomes extremely difficult the capacity is very less in the market it is very expensive so it's normal to adopt floating structures like what you see here it is semi submersible for the exploration stage and these are the production platforms in the deep waters this is the, the tension leg platforms single point anchor reservoir platforms okay but however these floating structure also has to be anchored into the ground for them to be positions during the life of those uh, structures so thus geotechnical assessment is very important extremely important for design of these anchor systems in deep water is a very complex uh, field you can see these uh, floating structures will be anchored okay and there will be several uh, well heads the production lines the injection lines the flow lines okay and this is in 1350 meters of water depth so all these shallow structures requires a thorough understanding of the ground characteristics the geo hazards etc we'll just talk about these things in the next few slides so these are the uh, deep water single point anchor reservoir reservoir projects i'll talk about this mad dog uh, spar project this is in gulf of mexico is a beautiful case study i'll present this at the end of this presentation now those anchoring systems can be many types a simple plump weight or we call it as a dead man anchors the pile can be driven and these anchors can be hooked to the pile it can be a simple drag anchors and generally in the deep water the suction anchors is very very popular and very widely used so what does this do you have a closed end at the top open end at the bottom so you have a pump at the top Okay, as you lower down into the seabeds, then the water will enter first. There will be some sulfate penetrations. Later on, will be pump will be operated to pump out some water from the inside to create a pressure difference between the inside and the outside. What are then due to this pressure difference, the suction will be created. It will suck the soil inside, taking the advantage of the weight of the water above it. This will be driven below. So there will be different uh, stages of suctions created. So suction assisted driving of these piles by making use of the advantage of the water depth above the pipe okay and then the, the anchor will be hooked to this uh, suction anchors and this will act as an anchor it's very very popular and very widely used for deep water applications and of course there are many other patented technologies uh, similar functions 
Now, the elements to manage and mitigate risk for offshore development. First of all, this integrated approach to site investigation, which itself is a challenge. Now, once you get the characteristics of the grounds, identify the geohazards and the ground model ready, then it becomes very simple for the designs. And so, this is the uh, <coughs> same case for any structures, either it is built in the ocean or built in the land. And then you develop the terrain models combining the engineering geology, geophysics, and geotechnics. This is the uh, information you gather from the integrated uh, investigations. Of course, you have to have quality assurance system in place. And risk assessment and mitigation assessment to be carried out at project commencement and reassessed at each key stage to the life of the project. Open and clear communications between all the stakeholders and more importantly you have to deploy skilled qualified and experienced persons otherwise the project will not be successful be it engineers geologists geophysicists drillers and maybe even during the course of the constructions you need to have good project managers construction managers etc for the success of these kind of projects so we advocated this integrated approach it requires multidisciplinary geo teams need to have the geophysist you need to have the geologist the geotechnical engineers and the designers as i said also during the construction you need the project management and the construction professionals very experienced people for the success of these projects so let me go through the geophysical part how the survey is carried out and why is carried out normally the geophysical survey is carried out to determine the bathymetry the nature of seabed and the sub bottom geology of the proposed site and also to identify possible hazards is very important maybe it is a seabed obstructions it is an existing pipeline there could be some submarine cables you don't want to go and damage these things there may be some poke marks buried channels rock outcrops these are the hazards that are going to uh, impede the safe installation of the structures so you need to evaluate those hazards based on the geophysical data this geophysics also will aid in evaluation of engineering characteristics of uh, shallow soils and of course the correlation of uh, seismostratigraphy with the borehole for evaluation of soil over the foundation that essentially to understand the lateral continuity of the strata so i'll explain to you in the case studies and normally you perform a hydrographic survey maybe the bathymetry using echo sounders it can be a single beam echo sounder or a multi beam echo sounder this will give you the image of the seafloor. Sorry, the water depths, so we can give the characteristics of the seafloor. Side scan sonar will give you the image of the seafloor. So it can identify any buried objects, uh, shipwrecks, and so on. And sub bottom profile will give you the characteristics or the stratigraphy below the ground. So the bathymetry is normally conducted like this in a grid fashion, both the directions. Okay, it can be a single beam where the data acquisition is only on one point. If it is a uh, multi beam, you have a swath bathymetry where the coverage is for a wider area. Normally, more than about 10 meters you can have in one single data acquisition line. And you get this envelope of uh, the seabed seafloor conditions. These are very uniform, so you can see a mound at its locations. This is the side scan sonar, it's a tow fish. Okay, then you get the data acquisitions. This uh, edge can be able to reveal the shipwrecks there could be some uh, ripples sand ripples there could be some poke marks there could be some craters etc so the side scan sonar will be able to identify these things then the sub bottom profile is to get the stratigraphy below the ground so this is normally done by various uh, equipments uh, finger and the chirper these are the very high frequency but the penetrations will be very shallow Okay. And, uh, probably between 5 to 10 meters. Boomer, it has a low frequency, which can penetrate to deeper depths, particularly in the homogeneous soils. And Sparker will penetrate to deeper depths, and this is a high energy sub bottom profiler. So, when you do a uh, sub bottom profiler, you can get the characteristics or the stratigraphy below the ground. As you can see, the example of the chirper data very nicely, the seabed has been depicted. You can also see the first layer, this is an isopack, okay, the silt layer, then you have a gravel deposit, you can have the rockets, some accumulated shallow gas can also be determined if it is at the shallow depths. As I said, the chirper and the finger data can only be the data, very good data in the top, about 5 to 8 meters. This will be very good for your pipeline engineering, you can have, uh, use this data for your shallow foundations. And the boomer data penetrates a little deeper, 
and you can see this is a channel features okay interpretation of this can be seen like this okay so this is a channel feature which was a river flowing several thousands of years before but recently there is a formation happened and also the very young the formation so the blue line is a seabed the immediate red line is a layer interface between a very soft place and this layer okay this channel is a hazard nobody want to put their foundation particularly jacob creeks in a channel because this is a plan is a predetermined values and it leads to uh, distress and these layers <coughs> will identify the strata below the ground now this geophysical surveys normally carried out in shallow waters as you go into the deeper waters maybe 1000 1500 meters 2000 meters those uh, tools on the surface you no know, will not have the resolutions to pass through those water columns so how to get the data in deep waters generally all those equipments will be housed within this autonomous underwater vehicles auv okay this will be remotely controlled it will be launched from the vessel and it will be taken almost to the bottom of uh, the water column that is about 3 meters off the seabed then you do the survey in a grid pattern okay and then you bring it back to the deck this is very popular to use uh, this autonomous underwater vehicles for the geophysical survey in deep water the same bathymetry multi beam uh, side scan sonar and the sub bottom profiler once you have carried out some the geophysical survey the next step is to identify the geohazards so these geohazards can be described as site and local conditions that is the seabed features or near surface events having a potential of developing into a failure event causing loss of life or investments okay. let us examine that the, i said the, the channel features itself is a geohazard just doing a borehole will not be able to uh, get this information okay in the absence of geophysics if you move the rig at these locations those foundations will be in a plank is a predetermined failure and you could see the distress to those structures thus this geophysics will be able to identify the geohazards and safely if you find these channel features the best thing is to avoid it so move the locations maybe to the left or to the right that is devoid of these channel features so i'll explain to you in one of the case study in deeper waters if there is any uh, seismic event on the continental shelf there could be some uh, submarine uh, slope failure this will lead to your mud flow into the abyssal plain okay so what happens here when the mud flow happens is a derby flow on the turbidity and current you see the shear strength this will be drop from 50 kilopascal almost nothing so it will be almost like a fluid so what happens if your infrastructure exists already with an anchoring system there is a submarine slide happening and this will knock off these uh, anchors so that will jeopardize the safety of those uh, infrastructure right so thus you, it is imperative that these geohazards to be identified then accordingly locate the locations which is safer for any of those infrastructure in the deep water the east coast of india i think reliance has done a good project uh, ravi bastia was for reliance was the padmashri awardee he has presented uh, this paper it was uh, published by springer okay. and identified several geohazards in the deep water east coast of india but out of all of them most significant is the slope instability because the sedimentation from the rivers joining the oceans and then any uh, events trigger <clears throat> like your seismic events then the slope stability because it's a continental shelf that is most uh, vulnerable and almost all the geo hazards will be uh, due to the slope instability of course there are some canyons and other let us examine a couple of them this is in the east coast you see these black lines demarcating the basins the top you have the mahanadi basins okay then you have the krishna godavari basins and this is where the existing oil and gas is happening and you have the kaveri polar basins as you could see here the gray ones has a very low slope the red ones has a very steep slope this is a continental shelf you know, very few kilometers the water depth drops from maybe some 100 meters to 1000 meters uh, within a short distance and these red ones are very steep slopes and the blue and yellow ones are the normal slopes the position of these uh, sediments from the rivers is a growing concern and also the slope stability 
will pose a lot of geohazards. So one of them is a canyons. So these canyons can be identified by your sub-bottom profilers. These are the conduits for high sediment flow. Okay. So what happens when your structure is uh, <coughs> almost uh, in line with this uh, sediment flow? This will knock off. So we don't want to put any structures where there is a canyons. Okay. And in addition to these canyons, there could be some submarine channels. You see, there is a flow direction, a lot of channels. Okay. So we don't want any structures uh, to be on the direction of these uh, channel features. So if geohazards are identified based on geophysics, you can safely relocate this to some, uh, some other uh, place where uh, these mud flows will not impede and jeopardize the safety of the infrastructure. Now, so when you have done the geophysical survey, you have identified the geohazards. Now, the next step is to carry out the geotechnical investigation. So the knowledge of seabed, soils, and rock is essential if the offshore structure are to be built safely and economically. And the offshore site investigation involves special problem raising the question, what is sufficient? So you need to have uh, enough data to represent three-dimensionally, both vertically and laterally, <coughs> all the stratigraphy, as well as the ground models. So that is the strength and deformation properties of each of those layers and, uh, and the geohazards based on the geophysics. So the success of these integrated site investigations depends on well-prepared budget. If you don't have budget, nothing will happen. You need to have good planning. For example, the geophysics should be done first, then the geohazards, okay, and then the geotechnical investigations. So sometimes we have seen that there will be a parallel activity, geophysics and the geotechnicals go hand in hand. So what is, uh, you have located the boreholes and uh, later on you identify the geohazards based on the geophysical data and these locations is not feasible. So you may have to go and redo the boreholes again. So that's again comes with cost and time, etc. So that's you require a thorough planning of all the activities in this integrated site survey. Finally, attention to quality and safety to develop an acceptable risk profile. We need to deploy uh, qualified and uh, skilled people. I already explained to you at the beginning. Otherwise, uh, the entire activity will not be successful. <clears throat> so the geotechnical investigations normally is carried out by a dedicated drill ship which has a moon pool that is opening the, at the center of the ship and also a dedicated drilling unit. Okay. The, in shallow waters up to 100 meters, these uh, uh, drill ships will be positioned at the locations using anchors. That is at the four corners, maybe around six uh, anchors or eight anchors, depends on the size of the vessels. Okay. If the water depth exceeds these 100 meters, then anchoring systems will not work because paying out and pay, uh, pulling out the anchors itself will be very tedious. You need big winches and so on. It will be very time consuming. And thus, for those deeper waters, more than 100 meters, the best way is to use the dynamic positioning systems. That is, the bow thrusters will be operating continuously and without anchors, this uh, ship will be held in positions using the dynamic uh, positioning system. For the seabed mode of sampling, you use DP1. For the drilling in deep waters, where you use do a soil borehole and collect samples, you need uh, two dynamic positioning systems. They are one of the backup. So site characteriz characterization in offshore involves in situ testing, and laboratory testings on the samples that is recovered from the investigation itself. So the in situ enterprise testing enterprise comprise of your cone penetration testing, your field vein test, this is a uh, conducted in situ in the boreholes, and T bar penetrometer and the ball penetrometer. So you can see the T bar and ball essentially for very soft clays because of its area. You normally use this uh, T bar and bulb penetrometer. The procedures are similar to the cone penetration test. Instead of the cone, you attach this bulb penetrometer and T bar penetrometers. So during the sampling process, you see the stages involved. You need to drill the samples, collect the samples, use Shelby tubes with an area ratio of about 10 percent so that the disturbance will be very, very minimum. Process these samples, storage, transportation extractions, prepare this for the testing in the laboratory. There are two modes of uh, investigations, particularly the drilling mode and the non-drilling mode. In the non-drilling mode, you tend to push the in situ testing to get the data from the seabed until the depth that these equipments are capable of. 
or you can also collect the samples at one shot from the seabed until the depth that those uh, systems are capable of recovering. If the data seabed mode is good enough for your designs, then you can uh, terminate your investigations. If it is not, then you have to resort to a conventional boring system. These are some of the in situ testing uh, seabed frames. All of them will be lowered into the seabed. Then if it is a cone penetration test, it will be pushed. If it is the samples, then you can push the samples itself. So generally, the seabed sampler <coughs> will be three types. One is the gravity core, vibro core, and the piston core. Okay. In the gravity core, you have a cutting shoe, and this is a core barrel. So normally, in the gravity core, we also call it a drop core. The core barrels will be made up to about three meters, and then you have a dead weight at the top. The entire unit will be lowered down into the seabed. It allowed to penetrate under sulfate, and finally you recover it to the deck, and you have samples about three meters. This vibro core, the core barrels can be made even longer, maybe up to six to seven meters, and you put electric motor at the top to vibrate, essentially to penetrate cohesion less soils. Okay. If you want little deeper depth of uh, investigations, you want to have the longer, then use the piston cores. So piston cores are like this. You make up the core barrel a little uh, longer. And the maximum I have seen about 30 meters uh, in one shot. You can make up these core barrels with a dead weight at the top. And you have the lever arm and a counterbalance. Okay. Now, the entire unit will be lowered down into the seabed where the counterbalance touches the seabed first. The liver arm will be lifted up. Okay, this gets unhooked and disengaged from the <coughs> dead weight uh, hook there. And once this happens, the entire barrels will be dropped into the seabed. It will penetrate, and the soil samples will enter the core barrel. Okay. Now, once uh, this has stopped the penetration, then the entire unit can be brought to the deck. You can see the piston corer penetrating the soil. You can see the soil smear here. Once it's brought to the deck. Then you can remove this cutting shoe. There will be a PVC liner inside. You can pull the PVC liner, cut into pieces, a meter of pieces, and you have the soil samples. Now, I have seen in project that we have made up the barrel up to 33 meters. We got samples up to 22 meters in one shot. So designing your anchor system, which is about 15, 20 meters, the data is good enough. Maybe you can just get away with the further investigation. I draw your attention here. This is the ultra short beacon line. This will record the coordinates where you are collecting the samples. Otherwise, <clears throat> you don't know which locations you are collecting the samples. And you see, these are the liner samples inside. These are cut into one meter pieces. And you can subject this to normal routine testing. So we'll just talk about what are the tests to be performed. It's also practice to collect some grab samples to uh, characterize the seabed samples. Okay. And this is a cone penetration test, the seabed mode. You push the cone, you make up the cone rods up to maybe around 30, 40 meters and start uh, pushing this. And it can penetrate maybe around 30 meters and you get the data from 0 to 30 meters without the borehole. That's what normally we also do in the land rigs. You know, we start pushing the cone from the ground until it uh, uh, penetrates or refuses. Then you get the data to that depth. So if this top 30 meters is not good enough, for example, pile foundation, you need 100 meters. Uh, depth of investigations, then you may have to resort further in the downhole mode. And also the pipeline, in the top half a meter of the data is very, very critical in the offshore for developing the seabed friction, trenching systems, and also to evaluate pipe settlements. So generally, this is done by collecting the box samples. You see the cube, 0.5 meter cube uh, box samples. You collect the samples and immediately you then do this T bar penetrometer, CPTs, ball penetrometers, and collect some undisturbed samples here and subject that for further testing on you. So, this will give you a very good coverage of this top half a meter, particularly useful for pipeline engineering. Then, the next step is the downhole mode. So, where your seabed mode is not enough, you may have to resort to the downhole mode, is normally done by the vessel. A dynamically positioning system to lower the template, seabed template, which will provide you reaction. And you have the drilling rig at the top, you lower the drill pipes and you collect samples here from the mud line. You collect samples, okay, then wash through this, collect another sample, wash through this, collect another samples, and continue until the intended target penetration. So instead of samples, you can also perform the in situ CPT test or the vein test. You 
push the cones here, then wash this borehole until that depth, then further you push the cone, then wash the depth and continue until the <coughs> intended penetrations. There are many survey vessels I could see here, which has a dedicated uh, drilling rig and you have a moon pool at the center. I had the opportunity at least to work on all of them as a quality control engineer representing the owners. These are all the shallow water uh, vessels which will be anchored and then positioning at the locations for drilling. So these are the deep water vessels. This is a Russian vessel called Bavanit. <coughs> And now these days there are a few more uh, assets that can uh, do the investigations in deep water. So the first step in any investigations, particularly in the downhole mode, is to establish the seabed. So once the seabed templates are lower down, you have lower down the drill pipes. The first step is to lower your bottom sensor into the drill pipes. If you come and nicely rest in this landing ring, okay, which is just about one to two meters off the seabed. So once this bottom sensor less on the landing ring, the entire drill pipe is pushed down, is lowered further. And you see here the switch touching the seabed, it get closed, the circuit get closed, you put a bulb here, the bulb will glow on the top. Right. So this, uh, this is very important. So once you establish that mud lines, you mark zero on the pipe to some reference on the deck and immediately collect your mud line samples. Maybe you push one meter from that level, you get the mud line zero to one meters. Okay. And then you wash that one meter and collect the second in samples and continue until your design penetration. You see the samples collected at various intervals. Okay. And offshore, these uh, samples keep coming. Uh, turnaround time will be around uh, every 15 minutes if the contractors and the building systems are very good. And for every samples, you need to process it, cut the samples, do a lot of testings, and then pack it for further testing on show. I draw your attention also one of the important aspects is uh, to utilize the mud. Okay, The consistency of the mud should be of this order, the Marshall funnel between 60 to 90 seconds. So you take the mud with a known quantity and maybe a liter and pour it into this funnel closed at the bottom and later you record the time to empty this uh, drilling fluid. If it empties around 30 seconds, that means it is uh, very highly fluid, so you add more mud. If it empties in 120 seconds, it's very, very thick, you won't add water. So you try to get these details and then accordingly uh, have the consistency such that your Marshall funnel will be around 30 to 90 seconds. And also you can measure the viscosity within this scale. You fill up this cup with the mud. Okay, this is a graduated scale here. You see the bubble. So you adjust it like a triple beam balance and directly you can read on top of the scale what is the viscosity. Nine parts per gram is the general viscosity that is preferred for the drilling fluids. So what happens if you don't use appropriate consistency of the mud? Then the boreholes are not washed properly. You will end up having wash samples. So these are not the gravels, but actually the clay sand. Okay, all the fines have been washed and then you see only these gravel pieces. So this is badly disturbed. We don't want to see that kind of material. And also, if the boreholes are not washed properly, even cohesive soils, it is very difficult to get the undisturbed sample. These stiff clays, now you have the soft consistency. So it is imperative that the boreholes are nicely washed and use appropriate consistency or the viscosity of the mud for keeping the boreholes clean and get good data. Sometimes you also tend to get very good undisturbed samples in sandy soils. So the experience is very important. Those engineers who are very inexperienced, they cut the samples and take to take pictures. Uh, rather, you would have preferred to nicely pack the samples for further testing on show. So that's where your training is important. Your experience is important. You need to always deploy uh, experience manpower on the job. So these are very, very expensive uh, activities. So what are the tests that is performed offshore? Torben, minivan, pocket pentrometer, and unconsolidated undrained. These are the undrained shear strength measurements. Then you have the unit weight moisture content reaction to fix here. So let us examine each one of them. So this is a torben. You have the vein blades. Okay, you press it <coughs> into the flat surface, and then with a uniform vertical pressure, you try to rotate this and allow the soil to shear. It cannot slip. It has to shear. Once the soil shears, then you can read on the graduated scale at the top directly the undrained shear strength. Okay. And this is a miniature vein. The vein blade is inserted into the soil. 
you have the springs of different stiffness you have a zero reading then rotate this such that there will be a shear of the sample by the vane blade and you note down the final uh, degree so you know the degree of rotations and there is a calibration constants by, for the combination of the spring and the blade size kpa per degree if you know what is the degree of rotations you apply that constant then you can get directly the under shear strength and this is a pocket pentrometers you have a stylus or a splinter at the bottom you call it a stylus one diameter into the soil you push it you have this calibrated spring the graduated scale this will directly read your unconfined compressive strength half the unconfined compressive strength is the under shear strength of soils the next step is your unconsolidated under interaction test this is very popular and more reliable because of the confined confining pressures you are bringing this in situ stress conditions okay and then you have the stress strain curve develop the deviator stress half the deviator stress is your under shear stress i'm sure these are all very basic testing that will be followed on every meter of soils water content you can do it for every meters unit weight you know the volumes you take the weight to get your unit weights and very important reaction to hcl 10% hcl you just make a drop uh, one or two drops on the soil and observe the reactions if is no reaction then it doesn't have any calcium carbonate content if it is vigorously reacts that means this soil has high calcium carbonate content so when you see a vigorous reactions then you subject these samples for further testing in the onshore laboratory for calcium carbonate so higher the calcium carbonate more problematic is the soil for an example if you have a sand the siliceous sand and a carbonate sand so the carbonate sand the capacity will be almost one fifth of what a capile capacity in a siliceous sand so it is very important to characterize uh, for the carbonate content and appropriately develop your drone model for the design of those structures built in that kind of soils soil structure you see the silicon is all not the life cut okay these are the weak planes exist in the ground under low stress conditions this uh, uh, failure will happen and the surface will be soapy structure so we need to record uh, to identify this as a soil structure in the logging part and also you can see the samples coming out of sample tube is expansive so this indicates there could be some accumulated shallow gas when you see this kind of expansiveness you better be careful because there could be blowouts right this is a high pressured accumulation of shallow gas within the and nicely you pack these samples further testing onshore so it has to be stored vertically and transported without disturbance for deep water samples one will store in a refrigerated containers to maintain at 4 degrees this is a requirement so the temperature changes will drastically alter the properties of those samples particularly the deep water samples so friends so we have seen the geophysical survey in both shallow water and deep water deep water we have seen what are the uh, geohazards and the geotechnical uh, investigations both in the seabed mode as well as in the downhole modes and what tests to be performed on those samples uh, and uh, further use all the information for the design of foundations so now i'll just go through some few case studies the first case study will be shallow water mud mat so it is a simple bearing capacity problem right so you can see these mud mats can be of different shape different sizes okay and very important when the investigations is happening for the pile the foundations okay when your interest is about 150 30 meters the top half 5 meters is of no consequence or significance for the design of foundations the contractor simply generates a 2 to 18 kilopascal of uh, uh, design profile at the top 4 meters okay so this is a design profile by the contractor but closely examine the all the other tests that is performed okay you could see that the shear strength is only around 4 kilopascal at the top 4 meters this may essentially not hamper your pile designs right what it does definitely uh, your bearing capacity computations now you are overestimating the shear strength that means you are not conservative so you are under predicting the capacity i mean sorry over predicting the capacity okay so <clears throat> and also the seabed itself could be a mound right if you don't have the geophysical uh, data you will not be able to identify so what if the four leg jacket one of the corner of the legs is on this mound 
the other three are leaning towards one side okay and this is what you have can happen the jacket structure four leg appended immediately after unhooking from the crane it capsized so 40 million dollars gone into the oceans maybe the geo hazards have not been identified for this location probably perhaps added to it the shear strength the top uh, four five meters was not interpreted properly and thus there could be a bearing capacity failure there could be also a geo hazards due to the slope instability I mean, seabed instability this is a tripod jacket okay this is a triangular mud mat this was in indonesia the piling was completed during uh, the construction of the piling the contractor took about two extra days to level the jacket before the piling happened so they complained to the owners that uh, geotechnical data supplied by the owner is uh, inaccurate and thus they have to spend two additional days in leveling the uh, jackets before the piling started and they claimed for the variation amount then the principal client they said that if you can get a certificate from dr Partha, then probably we'll look at uh, your variation and try to reimburse so our uh, principal client was also my client i represented them supervising this uh, geotechnical investigation and the contractor is also my client uh, we involved in during the construction for monitoring the piles if you closely examine you see a soft layer on three kilopascals below that is very strong layers okay and i already explained this how important it is to establish the seabed and collect your mudline samples and also use a liner samples in very soft place you know, otherwise it will slip there so these are polycarbonate liner materials all this process was followed there and thus has to reject as uh, these data were of highest standards so the contractor could not uh, claim further but we went ahead to see what was the problem there in the locations if you examine the bathymetry chart in these circled locations you see the bathymetry is around 82.3 to 82.5 meters as against the rest of the locations about 81.4 to 81.6 meters this is a trough at this uh, uh, locations probably some part of the triangular mud mat was in this trough so this was also evident from the multi-beam that this platform was installed in the seabed trough we closely look at the <coughs> data and zoomed it you could see that one of the corner of the mat was placed on this slope and it's very soft place and this is very very important and people ignore uh, this correlation between the geophysics and geotechnical data this was not considered during the installation phase and thus they have to put the jacket on the slope which took more time and thus we said that you have not uh, considered the integrated approach and finally client did not pay any money next uh, case study is the jacob rig you see the same tripod with the jacob rig coming uh, for the second time during the production stage okay now when you have a geophysical data when you get a boreholes within the channel feature this is a channel the yellow one you can see the orange one is the channel you don't want to locate your borehole i mean jacob rig in the channel features so we, with the availability of the geophysical data you see that there is a channel features then you tend to push it outside right when you push it outside this is devoid of the first channel but you still see a second channel a little deeper depth we also do not want because if the jacket rig penetrate this layer and come and stop here this will be again in the flank and thus the third locations was identified and this was devoid of both the channels in directions northwest and so with these two directions this location was devoid of both the uh, channels and this is very important in the planning so why this happens because the geophysical data and the geotechnical survey was happening simultaneously or parallelly that's why you don't have time to make an assessment of the geohazards and thus you have to redo the boreholes in these locations so that's why always you need to plan ahead on a uh, phased manner this is one uh, deep uh, projects actually one of the projects for approval of my cv people said that you don't have experience in working in deep waters so i had to go and pick them give them evidence to show that i have worked in this uh, drill ship is a deep water drill ship was in malaysia we went to the site also picked up okay in 2005 this was a russian vessel Bavanik. so later 
I think probably they accepted to review the data, but then I'm not going to present this because of the confidentiality of the data, but I'm going to present, which is much more interesting, which is already been published. So this deep water for a floating production offloading facility is a Mad Dog Spa development project in Gulf of Mexico in 1348 meters water depth. Okay. So you see these floating production systems will be in the anchors. You have the cluster one, cluster two, and cluster three. As you can see in the image itself, these are the debris flow, mud flow. This already happened. So the stratigraphy here will be highly heterogeneous. Thus, you require to a, a intensively investigate. Okay, you have one borehole, one CPT for each of those anchor locations. On the contrary, you could see these two locations are in fairly uniform site. Okay, and you see the number of boreholes. There is only one borehole and two CPT. And here there is only one borehole, one CPT. That means 50% of the scope of geotechnical investigations has been minimized based on the geophysical data. So let us examine this. So this is a cluster two where you have one borehole, one CPT for all the anchors. And all the anchors were successfully in, installed. And this they have to perform because there is a debris flow and the materials is likely to be very heterogeneous. And this was what was figured out during the investigations. And the course the analysis suggested that this debris flow uh, deposits in the slump core. And these were highly variable since they were deposited as part of massive debris flow. And the soils in the debris flow deposit consist of interbreded zones of soft debris flow material, silts, sand layers, and stiff debris flow block. On the contrary, the clusters one and three, these other two clusters were located where very uniform and continuous sediment layers existed. Okay. You see the subbottom profile between the cluster one and three is so homogeneously and laterally continuous. All the layers one to seven is able to uh, detect throughout the sub-bottom profile between the clusters. That means it is laterally continuous, right? And thus, they said that there is no need for any additional data and the geophysics helped them to minimize the scope of geophysics, geotechnical investigation by almost about 50%. Okay. Now, you could also see that in the CPT trace that there are heterogeneous in the cluster three, the three CPTs done in the other two locations are on top of each other indicating is pretty uniform. So now I get into the last case study, maybe another five minutes I'm going to conclude. This is for an onshore development. This project was in Yemen. They wanted to build storage tanks to get rid of the floating production facilities that was in the offshore. They plan to have four tanks at these locations. As usual, as part of any uh, investigations, the phased approach was uh, followed here. Preliminary survey comprising your geophysical survey and the geotechnical uh, investigations, and the detailed survey, the geotechnical and the geophysical. During the detailed survey, the geophysical methods was very low frequency electron magnetic method that was followed. So these are the data points. The blue ones scattered are the preliminary geophysical data points. Okay, and you see these are the geotechnical boreholes during the preliminary investigations. Finally, when they located these tanks, then the green ones are the detailed geophysicals, and those inside are the boreholes, detailed geotechnical boreholes. The conclusions drawn from those reports in the preliminary geophysical survey: no major cavity or fractures or joints are present in the study area. From the Gilo technical survey, these cavities or voids do not seem to be widespread. So these are the conclusions drawn from the Gilo technical preliminary survey. As you could see, the plot of the n values, n50, you see here, in the top 20 meters, n is less than 50. So this is a compressible zone. Okay. Beyond that is a refusal stratum. Limestone is an incompressible zone. So our interest will be the top. 20 meters. In the detailed geotechnical survey, no cavities or open joints or cracks were observed in any of the drilled boroughs. That was the conclusion. But in the detailed survey stage, the geophysical methods, very low frequency electromagnetic methods, identified the small cavities are around 5 to 6 meters below the ground in tank 1 and in tank 2. 
So this actually puzzled people, okay, how these cavities will impede in the safety of the foundation. Actually, this is a very large diameter tank, <laughs> about 85 meter diameter, and these small cavities would really not matter. The arching effect can close it, okay. But they were all puzzled, and all of them, the stakeholders, uh, decided together that they have to open up. Okay. Before that, you see that the detailed geophysical survey concludes that two intermediate near surface highly fractured caverns were encountered within five to six meters. All the stakeholders wanted to open up and target those cavities, okay, and then backfill it back, and then you construct the foundation. They decided, okay, this is a tank for both one and four. This is the target locations. This is the excavation area. When they started excavation, instead of this, they could see these high fractures and also fractures, but naturally filled with fine soils. You see the large diameter tank area, and this is the excavation. And some of the fractures were as wide as around 300 millimeters to 400 millimeters. Uh, this really puzzled them again, and then they don't know how to go forward. That's how when they reached out to us, we reviewed the data and suggested them that we need to make this cavity assessment or cavity mapping by thorough investigations again on the grid fashion, both sides performing the geoelectrical resistivity methods and all the four tanks. We suggested this to be around 300 meters on both directions. But they said, no, they don't have budget because this is non-tendered additional item. In the tank, the diameter was around 85 meters. They Prefer to have only about 125 meters. They said, okay, let us move on. Okay, the survey was carried out at 20 meters uh, grids on both directions, yeah. about 125 meters. The survey period durations was about six weeks in Yemen. Yes. Surface tank elevation one, you see this 1.9 meters, 2 meters, 8 meters, and 18 meters, because top 20 meters was our interest. We did not see any cavities here except the small ones. So we cleared this tank to go ahead with the same foundations, whatever they were planned. And so with this surface elevation of two, we did not see any problem. Two meters, eight meters, and eighteen meters. We cleared this tank two and tank three. You see this cavity interpreted, which was outside the uh, influence of this tank. Therefore, we also cleared this. Uh, third tank and they continued to do the same foundations. Lastly, it's very interesting that this tank four interpreted huge cavities, okay, five meters, eight meters, 13 and 18 meters. Uh, to have these cavities at all depths in the top 20 meters, about 30 to 35 percent of the stressed zone is infilled with so with cavities. Nobody wants to put this tank when you see this kind of cavities because even during hydro test there will be translational tilt. When this happens, there is no way to correct uh, those tilt in the tank. The two options: one is to grout this, or to move this tank away from these locations. So the grouting to cater this volume will cost them around five six million dollars. They estimated. But sacrificing the existing foundations and move this tank away would cost them about a million dollars. Then they were very keen that they will move the locations. Now they decided to move the center of the tank outside by about 25 meters. But now we have a problem here. So we do not have the data at these locations. Initially, we told them to have 300 meters, but they did only 125 meters. Now we have to do further survey here with some overlapping lines, both directions and continue for these locations. It finally, a lot of resistance, the client agreed that they have to do this survey. But apparently when they decided and the team was ready to go, Yemen unrest is happening for the last couple of years. This project is on hold. All the team has been demobilized. Probably when it stabilizes and recovers, there's no unrest. We may go back and do the survey again and then we close these projects. Probably with this COVID, it may not be possible for so maybe another one year or one and a half years. I'm just waiting if this can conclude. So I sum up in few slides concluding the, my presentation. <clears throat> the shallow hazard geophysical survey plays a vital role in defining site conditions during an integrated geoscience study for both offshore and online developments. So I thank all the participants for patient hearing. 
and the Amity University for giving me an opportunity to share some experience. I'll be very happy if there's any questions to address. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, sir. Uh, it's a wonderful presentation and very informative. I have one uh, question from our uh, department uh, because this uh, offshore engineering only like NIT and M IIT have these uh, subjects. But uh, for our students, if you want to learn this, what is the uh, possibility from your end? Sir? How you can support for our students or like a UG, PG, and PhD students if they are interested? Because it's a very uh, important topic. I am aware of this offshore engineering. But if you, my students want to learn this, what is the support you can extend, sir, from your company? Uh, no, you can. We can have maybe some interns coming in because there are a lot of interns come uh, who can join us. Okay, but we can conduct some small courses, short term course to give a lot of information on this offshore geotechnical engineering. Okay, yes, so sir. we can work out this. Uh, maybe we can discuss and see how it work out for both of us. Thank you. With this, I would like to complete my vote of thanks. I will. I am sure that our students, faculty, and staff members have benefited by attending this webinar. First of all, I wish to thank our uh, director, Dr. S. N. Sridhara, for providing us with all possible logistic support towards organizing this event. And also, I sincerely thanks to our speaker, uh, Dr. Parsarathy, for accepting our invitation to be a guest speaker for the webinar. And also, I thank Mr. Ankit Batra for his support for organizing this seminar. At the end, I once again heartily thanks to all participants, faculty, staff members, and students for their support and making this webinar successful. Thank you, one and all. Uh -huh.